This is a shocking maritime disaster. On the night of July 29, 1945, as most people were deep in slumber, a cruiser with 1,196 sailors aboard was navigating the Pacific Ocean. Yet, the tranquility of the deep seas shattered by the sudden onslaught of six torpedoes, one of which struck the cruiser's ammunition depot directly. Consequently, the cruiser, in merely 15 minutes, was forced to merge with the ocean, and 900 crew members managed to escape from the doomed vessel. Unbeknownst to them, this disaster was merely a preface. A more chilling and daunting test of survival was subtly unfurling. Schools of sharks roamed the seas, commencing their dreadful reign of terror. These unarmed crew members faced merciless. One after another vanished into the chilling sea, until only 317 survivors remained. As they miraculously persevered, their eyes filled with fear and despair. This kind of suffering seems to be even more torturous than death itself. Their existence was like that of lonely dancers on the edge of an invisible world, gasping for life under the shadow of death. This tragedy became the saddest page in the history of the United States Navy. To this day, those who have experienced that history still feel extreme panic in memory. This incident remains a mystery to this day. In July 2017, a team led by Microsoft co-founder Paul G. Allen ventured into the Philippine Sea, reaching a depth of 5,500 meters, approximately 18,000 feet, where they ultimately discovered the long-lost wreckage of the USS Indianapolis cruiser. Today, we embark on a journey through history, re-examining the illustrious yet tragic fate of the USS Indianapolis cruiser. During its service in the U.S. Navy, the Indianapolis experienced many legendary events. The Indianapolis CL, CA 35 measures 610 feet 3 inches around 186 meters in length, with a whopping displacement of up to 9,950 long tons, roughly 10,110 tons. On the cruiser were for aircraft, primarily tasked with missions in New Jersey, Ulithi, Pearl Harbor, Guantanamo Bay, Kyushu, and Okinawa Island. Due to the services provided during World War II, the Indianapolis was the recipient of 10 battle stars. The New York Shipbuilding Corporation in Camden crafted this majestic warship. Due to the original light armor it was equipped with, it got categorized as the CL-35 model. The characteristics of light armor include thin thickness and the use of high-strength steel or aluminum alloy materials, despite its light weight. It can effectively defend against light weapons such as machine guns, small-caliber artillery, and shell fragments. Light armor typically deploys in less critical parts of the ship, including the superstructure, deck, and sides, enhancing the speed and agility of cruisers due to the reduced weight. Light cruisers, renowned for their superior speed, agility, and potent firepower, are equipped with smaller caliber main guns that achieve a higher rate of fire. They excel at accurately and efficiently engaging enemy vessels and other targets. The specific caliber and quantity of the main guns on light cruisers vary based on the vessel's type and design. For instance, during World War II, the American Brooklyn class light cruisers had 15 main guns of 152 mm each, while the Soviet Sverdlov class light cruisers had 12,150 mm main guns. On July 1, 1931, after being equipped with a Tinch 203 mm main guns, this military vessel, christened after the capital city of the state of Indiana, was promoted to a heavy cruiser and renumbered CA-35, launched in the same year. Sponsored by Miss Lucy Taggett, daughter of the late Senator Thomas Taggett, the following year, it served in the Philadelphia Navy Yard, commanded by Captain Smealy, the first captain of the Indianapolis. On June 23, 1933, Captain Henry Kent Hewitt took command. After undergoing significant repairs at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard, it became known as the Ship of State of President Franklin Roosevelt and became a source of pride for the locals. On July 1, 1933, witnessed by the residents of Campobello Island, Maine, the locals watched the exhilarating moment of President Roosevelt boarding her. Two days after the president's visit, 
The accompanying delegation concluded their visit, and the famous warship immediately returned to the Philadelphia and Naval Shipyard. In August of that same year, it set out on its maiden cruise under the command of Captain Hewitt. During the cruise, the Indianapolis visited several ports in the Caribbean area, including Guantanamo Bay in Cuba and San Juan in Puerto Rico. That is a standard routine for new vessels coming into service, as it necessitates the inspection of ship systems and presents an excellent opportunity for crew training. During this period, crew members engaged in numerous training activities, such as shooting, launching torpedoes, and damage control exercises, all to ensure they could aptly navigate and control the ship under conditions. But they didn't train for what to do when encountering sharks. On September 6th, Secretary of the Navy Claude A. Swanson raised the flag on the Indianapolis, initiating a journey to the Pacific. The purpose of this trip was to inspect the fleet and evaluate its state of readiness for combat before arriving in San Diego. The Indianapolis visited Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and Balboa in the Panama Canal Zone. Swanson was deeply impressed by the USS Indianapolis and its crew, praising the ship's performance during the tour. On October 27, 1933, Swanson disembarked in San Diego. This visit marked a significant event in the early history of Indianapolis, showcasing the ship's capabilities and readiness for battle as the flagship of the United States Navy. It officially assumed the role of flagship for the scouting force on November 1st. The reconnaissance unit is a vital component of the U.S. fleet, tasked with reconnaissance missions and safeguarding the fleet from enemy attacks as the flagship. The USS Indianapolis serves as the command center for the reconnaissance unit. During this period, the Indianapolis participated in several significant fleet exercises in the Pacific region. On May 29, 1934, they arrived in New York City. The cruiser had the honor of participating in a fleet review alongside President Roosevelt, with Indianapolis leading the fleet in a parade up the Hudson River in New York City. It showcased the formidable military strength of the United States Navy. After returning to Long Beach on November 9th, Indianapolis participated in several tactical war simulation exercises alongside the reconnaissance fleet. These exercises helped prepare the Indianapolis and its crew for the challenges of World War II. In the remaining years of peace, the USS Indianapolis cruiser remained active. On November 18, 1936, it welcomed President Roosevelt aboard in Charleston, South Carolina, beginning a visit to South America. The fleet visited Rio de Janeiro, Buenos Aires, Montevideo, and other places, safely returning the president to Charleston on December 15th. As global political tensions escalated, the USS Indianapolis cruiser and its crew began rigorous military training, preparing for potential conflicts. Upon Japan's bombing of Pearl Harbor, the aircraft carrier Indianapolis promptly launched a mock bombing on Johnston Island and immediately joined the 12th Special Mixed Fleet in pursuit of a reportedly nearby Japanese aircraft carrier. It arrived at Pearl Harbor December 13 and joined the 11th Special Mixed Fleet for combat operations. Her first action took place in the enemy-controlled waters approximately 350 miles south of Rabaul in the South Pacific's New Britain area. On February 20, 1943, the Indianapolis and other U.S. warships were attacked in two waves by 18 Japanese bombers. U.S. warships shot down 16 attackers and two Japanese seaplanes that were following, and all U.S. warships survived the attack. On March 10, 1943, bolstered by the Yorktown aircraft carrier, the U.S. forces the Japanese held ports of Lai and Salamaua in New Guinea. U.S. carrier-based aircraft, swooping over the Owen Stanley Mountains, caught the Japanese off guard, inflicting substantial damage on their vessels and aircraft. The number of American casualties was relatively limited after these events. The Indianapolis returned to the United States for comprehensive repairs and modifications at the Mare Island Navy Yard. The Indianapolis's inaugural combat operation proved successful, showcasing both the vessel's martial prowess and the proficiency of its crew. Subsequently, the ship was involved in numerous other vital conflicts as part of the Pacific War after the refitting process. The Indianapolis escorted a fleet to Australia, 
then proceeded to the North Pacific, where Japanese forces had already been in the Aleutian Islands. The Aleutian Islands are notorious for their harsh conditions, perpetually shrouded in bitter cold, fog, and constant drizzle, and occasionally punctuated with sleet and abrupt, unpredictable storms. The roaring winds and surging waves paint a stark picture of nature's raw and unwavering ferocity. On August 7th, the task force belonging to the Indianapolis finally found a loophole in the dense fog. The Japanese base was lurking on this island named Kasaka Island. The American fleet ventured to scout around the undeveloped coastline. The Indianapolis's 8-inch guns fired alongside other vessels. Despite the fog hindering observation, reconnaissance planes launched from the cruiser reported ships sinking in the harbor and facilities onshore catching fire. The abruptness in tactics was so thorough that the coastal artillery didn't react until 15 minutes later. Some gunners mistook it for an air raid and fired into the air, but most were held in check by the pinpoint firepower of the ships. Shortly after, Japanese naval submarines surfaced, only swiftly repelled by the depth charges from American destroyers. Similarly futile were the bombing attempts by Japanese seaplanes, despite the lack of detailed intelligence. This operation was nonetheless highly successful, underscoring the importance of establishing bases near Japanese-controlled areas. Building on this understanding, the United States subsequently occupied Etak Island, providing a suitable base for surface vessels and aircraft further away from the Dutch harbor chain. In the early stages of 1943, Indianapolis supported the U.S. operation to secure Anchitka, bolstering American military presence within the Aleutian Islands. On the evening of February 19th, the cruiser, accompanied by two destroyers, sailed south to intercept Anami vessels transporting reinforcements to Kiska and Atu. During this mission, it encountered the Japanese freighter Akagain Maru, which, after being hit by an 8-inch cannon shell, exploded and sank, believed to be heavily laden with ammunition. During the following spring and summer, the Indianapolis undertook escort duties and provided support for amphibious assaults in the waters surrounding the Aleutian Islands. By May, the U.S. military had regained control of Atu, reclaiming the American territory that had initially fallen into Japanese hands. With Atu secured, attention turned to Kiska, the last remaining Anami stronghold in the Aleutian Islands. However, the Japanese managed to evacuate the area, taking advantage of persistent dense fog before the planned U.S. landing. Subsequently, Indianapolis underwent modifications at Mare Island before relocating to Hawaii, where it became the flagship for Vice Admiral Spruini, commander of the 5th Fleet. The USS Indianapolis, a heavy cruiser, etched its name in, in the annals of World War II history through its pivotal role in multiple Pacific campaigns. From the bloody battlefields of the Gilbert Islands to the strategic conquests in the Marshalls and Carolines, Indianapolis served as a potent symbol of American naval might and unwavering resolve. On November 10, 1943, the USS Indianapolis, as part of the main force of the Southern Attack Force, embarked from Pearl Harbor to participate in Operation Galvanic, the invasion of the Gilbert Islands. On November 19, Indianapolis, leading a cruiser group, bombarded Tarawa, followed by a bombardment of Mackin the next day. The ship then returned to Tarawa, serving as a source of artillery support for the amphibious forces. That day, courageous Marines faced fanatical Japanese defenders head-on, witnessing a highly intense and costly battle. Indianapolis's firepower proved crucial, downing an enemy aircraft and bombarding enemy defensive positions. The vessel continued to play this pivotal role until three days later, when the island was declared completely leveled and destroyed. Following the victory in the Gilberts, the next target was the Marshall Islands. Once again serving as the flagship of the 5th Fleet, Indianapolis rendezvoused with other task force ships at Tarawa. On January 31, 1944, the cruiser group bombarded Kwayaline at all, paving the way for the landings. The bombardment continued on February 1st, 
With Indianapolis destroying to enemy coastal batteries, the following day, the ship targeted and destroyed a blockhouse and other coastal installations, providing crucial fire support for the advancing troops. On February 4th, Indianapolis entered the Kwayalan Lagoon and remained there until all resistance had disappeared. Following the successful Marshall Islands campaign, the cruiser Indianapolis continued to play a significant role in the Pacific War. Participating in the assault on the Carolyn Islands, the ship and its aircraft continued to serve as the flagship of the 5th Fleet, playing a pivotal role in disrupting enemy forces and further paving the way for Allied victories. On March 30th and 31st, 1944, carrier aircraft launched from Indianapolis attacked the Palau Islands, focusing on enemy shipping and airfields. The fact proved that the operation was highly effective. The attack resulted in the sinking of three destroyers, 17 freighters, and five all-tankers. Additionally, it caused damage to another 17 vessels. The fleet laid mines in the surrounding waters to further impede enemy movements. During these three days of intense operations, enemy aircraft attempted to counter the American offensive, launching attacks against the fleet. However, the Japanese attack was not only successfully repelled by the U.S. military, but also the American vessels sustained no damage. Additionally, they successfully destroyed 160 enemy aircraft, including 46 on the ground. These decisive victories in the air and at sea effectively prevented enemy forces in the Carolyn Islands from interfering with the planned U.S. landings in New Guinea. Following, we'll delve into the story of the USS Indianapolis cruiser in the Battle of the Philippine Sea. In June 1944, the Fifth Fleet attacked the Mariana Islands and commenced the invasion of Saipan on June 15th. The Indianapolis played a pivotal role in this offensive, initially supporting carrier aircraft, strikes from June 11th and then participating in the surface bombardment from June 13th onwards. However, on June 15th, Admiral Spruance received alarming news. A large Japanese fleet, consisting of battleships, carriers, cruisers, and destroyers, was steaming southward in an attempt to relieve the threatened garrison in the Marianas. Protecting the amphibious operation on Saipan was paramount, so Spruins could not risk diverting his powerful surface forces too far from the scene. Protecting Saipan Island is crucial for amphibious operations. Meanwhile, another force attacked Japanese air bases on Iwo Jima and Shishijima in the Bonin and Volcano Islands, respectively. These bases posed a significant threat as potential launching points for enemy air raids. On June 19, the opposing fleets clashed in the Battle of the Philippine Sea. Japanese carrier aircraft, hoping to utilize airfields on Guam and Tinian for refueling and rearming before attacking U.S. shipping, were met with fierce resistance from American carrier aircraft and anti-aircraft fire from escorting ships. This day became known throughout the fleet as the Marianas Turkey Shoot, as the U.S. Navy downed a staggering 400 to enemy aircraft while losing only 17 of their own. Indianapolis, operating with the attack force on Iwo Jima and Shishijima, contributed to this victory by shooting down a torpedo bomber. Ineffectively quelling the enemy's aerial resistance, American carrier aircraft pursued and sank to Japanese aircraft carriers, to destroyers, and an all-tanker. Simultaneously, they inflicted severe damage on other vessels. This decisive victory secured the Marianas and marked a turning point in the Pacific War. Indianapolis returned to Saipan on June 23 to resume fire support duties, later shifting to Tinian to destroy coastal installations on June 29. Meanwhile, Guam fell under occupation, and Indianapolis became the first ship to enter Apra Harbor since the fall of the U.S. base there early in the war. The ship continued to operate in the Marianas for several weeks before moving to the Western Carolines in preparation for further landings. The forthcoming skirmish will mark the final combat for the cruiser Indianapolis. After the Battle of the Carolyn Islands, she underwent major repairs at the Mare Island Naval Shipyard. On February 14, 1945, the vessel re-entered the Fast Carrier Task Force, commanded by Admiral Markey Mitchell, merely two days afterward. This ship got engaged in the famed Doolittle Raids, spearheaded by U.S. Army Brigadier General James Doolittle. 
It represented the initial strike on aircraft carriers since the inception of the air bombings. The aerial attack against the Japanese homeland served a twofold objective to back up the forthcoming U.S. landing on Iwo Jima and to devastate Japanese aviation facilities and other infrastructures on the mainland. The task force approached the Japanese coast under the cover of harsh weather. They accomplished a thorough tactical strike. Despite the loss of 49 carrier-based aircraft, the U.S. Navy still inflicted significant damage on the enemy, destroying a total of 499 enemy aircraft on the ground. In addition to this lopsided victory in the air, Mitchell's forces sank a carrier, nine coastal vessels, a destroyer to destroyer escorts, and a cargo ship. They also aimed at hangars, shops, aircraft facilities, factories, and other industrial targets. Throughout this operation, Indianapolis played a vital role as a support ship and contributed to the overall success of the task. Following the strikes, the task force immediately proceeded to the Bonin Islands to support the Iwo Jima landings. Indianapolis remained there until March 1st, providing crucial assistance in the bloody fight for the island by protecting invasion shipping and directing its guns against any targets identified on the beach. Rejoining Admiral Mitcher's task force just in time, the ship participated in another attack on Tokyo on February 25th, followed by a strike on Iaquito on the southern coast of Honshu the next day. Despite the extremely adverse weather conditions, the Americans managed to destroy 158 aircraft, sink five small vessels, and inflict damage on ground facilities and trains. With the need for a large base near the Japanese mainland, for further offensive operations, Okinawa in the Ryukyu Islands emerged as the ideal choice. In order to build it with minimal losses, the southern Japanese airfields became their primary targets for attack. The enemy, until they were unable to counterattack the invasion effectively. Departing Ulithi on March 14, 1945, Indianapolis joined the fast carrier force heading towards the Japanese coast. On March 18, aircraft carrier planes launched an attack on Kyushu airfields, primarily targeting Japanese fleet units at Kobe and Kor Harbor in southern Honshu. On March 21, having determined the location of the U.S. task force, the Japanese dispatched 48 aircraft to attack the ships. However, 24 carrier aircraft intercepted the enemy force approximately 60 miles out, resulting in the destruction of all attacking aircraft. From March 24, the crew aboard the USS Indianapolis cruiser launched a continuous seven-day bombardment of beach defense facilities using eight-inch guns. During this period, enemy aircraft repeatedly attacked the ships. Indianapolis shot down six aircraft and assisted in splashing to others. On March 31st, the day before the invasion, an unexpected event occurred. The airborne lookout on the ship spotted a Japanese single-engine fighter emerging from the dawn, diving vertically and whistling over the bridge. Tracers struck the aircraft, causing it to swerve, but the enemy pilot managed to release a bomb from an altitude of 25 feet before crashing his plane into the port side of the after main deck. While the damage is minimal when an airplane crashes into the sea, it's a different story when a bomb is involved. It first breaches the deck armor, then navigates through the crew's dining area at a parking bay with fuel tanks. Ultimately, it pierces the ship's hull and triggers an explosion beneath the water's surface. The bomb blasted to large holes at the bottom of the ship, not only flooding 900 compartments nearby, but also took the lives of nine crew members. Despite the ship's stern being stable and leaning to the port side, the Indianapolis had not previously endured such a progressive flooding scenario. This flagship cruiser quickly drove to a rescue ship for emergency repairs. Inspection revealed damage to her propeller shafts, ruptured fuel tanks, and destroyed distilling equipment. Despite such severe damage, the war-weary cruiser managed to cross the Pacific under its own power and reach the Mare Island Naval Shipyard for extensive repairs. On July 15, 1945, while the USS Indianapolis cruiser lay docked for routine maintenance, Captain McVeigh unexpectedly received an urgent directive from his superiors to embark on a mission of crucial importance in utmost secrecy. 
Transporting the crucial components of the world's first nuclear weapon used in warfare, the Little Boy. Due to the hazardous nature of the cargo, precautions against accidental detonation or radiation exposure were critical. The successful delivery of the Uranium-235 core of the Little Boy was crucial in the deployment of the first atomic bomb. As such, to maintain secrecy and minimize potential breaches of information, the components are transported individually and ultimately assembled on Tinian Island. Firstly, there's Uranium-235, the nucleus of nuclear weaponry, owing to its importance and sensitivity. It is air transported from the Los Alamos National Laboratory to San Francisco by a specially modified C-5 for transport aircraft. Other components, including the gun barrel, detonators, and other critical elements needed for the bomb's assembly and detonation were transported via ships from various locations to Tinian Island in the Pacific. The successful delivery of the Little Boy components was a critical step in the Allies' endeavor of developing the first series of nuclear weapons as part of the Manhattan Project. On August 6, 1945, atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, showcasing to the world the destructive power of nuclear weapons and their potential environmental hazards. The atomic explosions in Hiroshima and Nagasaki not only caused devastating destruction, but also significantly impacted the global political landscape, security treaties, and subsequent efforts for nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. On July 16, the USS Indianapolis cruiser departed from a secret naval base at the southernmost tip of the United States to carry out its mission, setting out from San Francisco. It bypassed scheduled sea trials and crossed the vast Pacific and Indian Oceans at astonishing speed. Its cargo not only contained crucial atomic bomb materials, but also advanced equipment required by scientists to assemble the weapons. In a mere 10 days, the USS Indianapolis cruiser completed a groundbreaking journey of 5,000 miles across the vast Pacific, arriving at Pearl Harbor on July 19th and sailing alone to reach Tinian Island on July 26th. This secretive and urgent mission would forever etch the USS Indianapolis cruiser into the annals of history, intricately linked to the advent of the Atomic Age and the conclusion of World War II. Having completed the expedited transportation of atomic bomb components, it heads towards Lady Gulf in the Philippines, where it meets up with other fleet forces, preparing for an attack on the Japanese mainland. Nevertheless, the maritime space from when she embarked was fraught with latent hazards. Not long ago, the U.S. destroyer Underhill sustained an attack from Japanese submarines within this vicinity, culminating in the heroic loss of 119 American sailors. Several merchant vessels also consecutively fell victim to the assaults. In light of this, Captain McVeigh proposed the inclusion of a destroyer escort for the voyage. Despite the legitimacy of Captain McVeigh's request for destroyer escorts, the Navy's high command dismissed it. The primary mission of all destroyers at the time was to escort transport planes to Okinawa and to rescue air crew shot down during B-29 raids on Japan. There was simply no capacity to divert additional destroyers besides. The Navy command thought that McVeigh's route was secured during wartime. Back then, many vessels, including a majority of destroyers, were outfitted with submarine detection systems. The Navy command wasn't aware that the USS Indianapolis cruiser didn't possess the same kind of system. Upon evaluation, they dismissed McVeigh's plea for escort, branding McVeigh the figure of military incompetence with no other option. Captain McVeigh had to guide the cruiser Indianapolis single-handedly and her crew toward Lady Gulf. He used a zigzagging anti-submarine track to strengthen safety measures. With the arrival of night and limited visibility, Captain McVeigh opted to switch to linear navigation mode, keeping the ship cruising at a steady speed of 15.7 knots, 29.1 kilometers per hour. At this very moment, the periscope of the Japanese submarine I-58 surfaced in waters 250 nautical miles north of Palau, where the lookout on the port side beam spotted a ship silhouette approximately 10 kilometers away. The submarine immediately submerged to periscope depth and closed in on the target. Commander Makatsura Hashimoto, aged 36, 
took command of I-58 in September 1944. He had 19 Type 95 torpedoes aboard his vessel, oxygen torpedoes capable of inflicting significant damage to a large warship with just one. Furthermore, on this expedition, six Chitin torpedoes were also aboard. The Chitin often likened to the underwater kamikaze with a diameter of one meter. The torpedo's interior can accommodate one crew member who guides the torpedo at high speeds toward enemy ships to improve assault precision. The Chitin harbors an explosive charge as high as 1.55 tons, three times the quantity of a conventional torpedo. Even a hit from one of these on a large warship could mean sinking or incapacitation. Captain Hashimoto observed through the periscope that the enemy vessel was cruising at 15.7 knots, maintaining a steady course without any deviation or escort that appeared to be an ideal target. Although the kamikaze pilots have prepared and resolved to carry out the attacks, Captain Hashimoto did not want the kamikaze squadron members to endanger their lives. He believed that employing traditional torpedo attacks alone would destroy the cruiser. Hence, he declined the deployment of the Chitin torpedoes, citing difficulties in observation amidst darkness. Captain Hashimoto repeatedly sounded the alarm, ordering all submarine crew members to prepare for battle. When the battleship Indianapolis was approximately 1,500 meters from the submarine, Hashimoto issued orders to launch six torpedoes from I-58. The torpedoes hit the American warship directly. The first torpedo, aimed at the bow of the ship, resulted in catastrophic damage. The second torpedo, even more tragically, struck the ship's fuel and ammunition depot, triggering a violent blast. The sudden and fierce attack caught the USS Indianapolis cruiser off guard, engulfing the entire ship in flames. Despite desperate attempts to send distress signals, no response ever reached them. The Navy has long claimed to have never received the distress signals because the ship was operating under a policy of radio silence, resulting in ineffective communication and severe consequences. Sadly, the deciphered records show that the Navy had received three distress signals internally. However, to the Navy's confidential mission protocol, the three commanders did not take these signals seriously. One commander was drunk. Another commander thought it was a plot by Japan and the third commander, prioritizing the interests of the Navy, ordered not to be disturbed. When the Indianapolis failed to reach its designated destination, the highest command of the U.S. Navy did not promptly discover the ship's absence. Although the U.S. Navy lost approximately 380 vessels during World War II, however, Captain McVeigh was the only person during the war to face military trial due to a maritime disaster despite his involvement in a secret mission requiring radio silence. This critical oversight resulted in a missed opportunity to rescue the crew of this storied warship. After the Japanese submarine completed the attack, Captain Hashimoto ordered the I-58 to submerge to 30 meters to reload torpedoes. Half an hour later, the submarine resurfaced to periscope depth, preparing for another supplementary attack. However, Captain Hashimoto was unable to locate the target through the periscope. Eventually, the I-58 surfaced directly, yet still showed no sign of sighting the target following this. Hashimoto commanded the submarine to head north and transmitted a report to headquarters. Hashimoto provided a detailed description of how it sank an American battleship along the route of the USS Indianapolis. Astonishingly, the U.S. military intercepted this telegram. The military deemed it a meticulously planned trap designed to lure the U.S. Navy into sending rescue ships, leading them into an ambush, but it went unnoticed. Once again, they overlooked crucial information that could have saved the lives of hundreds aboard the USS Indianapolis cruiser. The USS Indianapolis cruiser, constructed before World War II, had outdated equipment. The sailors' quarters lacked air conditioning, making conditions suffocating and sleeping difficult in tropical waters. After testing, the captain allowed sailors to sleep on the deck. The second deck and living areas remained open for ventilation, posing a danger in the event of an attack. The first torpedo from I-58 struck the starboard hull directly beneath the no, one turret, causing a tremendous shock and explosion that startled everyone aboard. 
The second torpedo exploded within the gap created by the first, further widening the damage. The third torpedo struck the ammunition magazine beneath the no, the turret, triggering a massive explosion and causing extensive damage to the forward part of the ship. With all power and communication systems on board disrupted, Captain McVeigh found himself unable to issue commands or assess the extent of the damage. Wireless telegraph distress signals are all transmitted through the backup power. Within minutes of being hit by torpedoes, the bow of the USS Indianapolis cruiser began to sink, quickly followed by the stern rising high into the air. The propellers emerged above the water as the vessel broke apart under gravity. Eight minutes after the initial torpedo strike, Captain McVeigh ordered the abandonment of the ship. However, over 300 crew members working or resting in the lower compartments went down with the ship. This 10. Zero-ton warship disappeared entirely beneath the within 12 minutes, leaving countless pieces of debris and over 800 individuals struggling in the whirlpool. Sadly, the USS Indianapolis cruiser did not carry lifeboats, only a small number of rudimentary rafts. Many sailors who jumped into the water lacked life jackets and could only gather any floating objects they could find empty all drums, broken planks, wooden crates and cling together, aiding each other while awaiting rescue. As night fell, many crew members formed small groups to protect each other. However, as the blood of the wounded seeped into the water, the challenges they faced became apparent. The scent of blood permeated the sea breeze. The sharks, evolved hunters honed over millions of years, could almost instantly detect the alluring scent, driven by ravenous hunger. These predators converged toward the injured sailors like a torrent. As the crew members watched the dark shadows rapidly approaching in the water, a chilling fear gripped their hearts. Some men clung desperately to the rafts, their eyes widening in terror as they watched the approaching shadows. The water around the rafts began to churn, ripples heralding the arrival of a predator. The dark shadows broke through the water, gigantic sharks, their sleek bodies attesting to their predatory prowess. The crew members braced themselves for the inevitable attack. With swift and ferocious actions, the shark lunges at the bodies of the deceased, pulling them into the depths of the dark and bloody ocean. This scene has heightened the sense of helplessness and vulnerability of some crew members. They knew they could be next. The ocean that had once nurtured them had now become their executioner, and the sharks were nothing but tools of the ocean's merciless judgment. The soldiers discovered that the sharks began by only seizing the dead, but later started to prey on individuals who had strayed slightly from the crowd. The soldiers started to regroup their forces. Whenever a shark approached, they joined forces to drive it away. They realized that sharks tended to avoid larger groups. They also found that banging objects and creating noise could temporarily scare away the sharks, despite taking such defensive measures. The school of sharks still dealt a heavy blow to these young warriors. Days passed, and many survivors either suffered from extreme heat and thirst or experienced hallucinations, leading them to drink the surrounding seawater, an act akin to a death sentence due to saltwater poisoning. Those driven to such desperation would often descend into madness, foaming at the mouth, with their tongues and lips swollen. The grim conditions for survival posed a threat to the survivors, just as the sharks circling below. Until 10 a.m. on August 2nd, a U.S. Navy anti-submarine bomber routine anti-submarine patrols, Lieutenant Chuck Wen, the pilot, inadvertently noticed a point of sunlight reflection on the sea surface. After staring at it for a few seconds, he realized it was a long all slick. This discovery kept him highly alert as based on Gwyn's reconnaissance experience. There could be a Japanese submarine preparing to surface for battery recharging, immediately lowering his altitude. He followed the all slick after flying about 15 miles eastward. His eyes widened he saw scattered debris of warships and desperate survivors scattered across the sea below. Chuck Wynn promptly radioed the U.S. military base on Palau Island about this discovery while dropping life rafts and supplies to the survivors in the water. Three hours later, a Catalina PBY seaplane under the command of LT, Adrian Marks, arrived at the scene and dropped life rafts and supplies for the survivors. 
This brave lieutenant defied orders by daringly landing on the water to begin rescuing survivors. Some survivors boarded the seaplane, while others strapped themselves onto the wings. Max and his comrades successfully brought out 56 survivors using this method. He also relayed the precise location of the cruiser wreckage to other U.S. Navy ships, triggering a swift response from five vessels to assist in the rescue. Following this, the U.S. military engaged all available air and ground resources for the rescue. As of August 8th, the rescue operation concluded. With the U.S. Navy tirelessly searching within a 100-mile radius around the clock, only 321 survivors out of the 1,199 crew members on board were successfully rescued, with four of them dying shortly after being transported to the hospital.